Back in the 1960s, legendary comic book writer Stan Lee was busy creating a packed roster of characters, a pantheon of his own, if you will. But somewhere along the lines, he took a step back from the more typical characters he had come to create, and took inspiration from some of the oldest stories in history, those of the Norse kind. It was here in the realm of the old Scandinavian gods that some might say Lee handpicked the God of Thunder himself, wrote him into the world of Marvel Comics, and with the artist Jack Kirby, gave us a character that would eventually become a household name. But how much did Marvel get right about the Norse God of Thunder? And were they able to do the Defender of Asgard justice? In today's episode, we'll be looking at who the original Norse Thor was, and how Marvel Cinematic Universe butchered him into a bl- I mean, put a spin on his character to make him more appealing to a modern audience. Physical Appearance It's probably pretty easy to imagine Thor with long blonde hair, either from the original illustrations by Jack Kirby in the 1960s comics, or by Chris Hemsworth's portrayal, who has since become pretty synonymous with the character. But it is believed that Thor from mythology did not possess fine Goldilocks, but instead had coarse red hair. Not only this, but he was also believed to come with an untamed beard worth its bragging rights. This may have simply been Lee and Kirby's attempt in the 1960s to make the character their own and present Thor as a brand new iteration, which is fair enough. However, one thing they may have also chosen to ignore was Thor's body type. In the MCU, Thor is undeniably crafted like a statue of a Greek god. But if we look at the mythological Thor's lifestyle, it's arguable that he would have looked much less toned and more barrel-shaped. This is deduced by his insane appetite, where he once ate two large oxen by himself, not to mention his fondness and capacity for mead. Now, you might argue that Marvel's Thor does emulate a similar physical appearance when he enters a state of depression, and essentially becomes Fat Thor. But I believe this state of him was more of a metaphor of how far he's fallen, and a reflection of his internal struggle, and inability to reconcile the past. The more barrel-chested Thor that I described was probably more celebrated for his hearty look and this may have been a sign of great fortune and strength, in that he not only had so much to eat, being a god, but that he also needed to eat so much. Thor's Arrogance and Short-Sightedness The original Thor from Norse mythology wasn't just the god of thunder, he could be attributed with presiding over the sky and being responsible for agriculture. Much as he was the protector of Asgard, the realm of the gods, he was also the protector of Midgard, the realm of the mortals, or Earth. He could be considered a sort of everyman's god, a god who despite being deified, was pretty much like a normal guy in the way he behaved. This was a god who loved to drink, loved to party, and if it came down to it, didn't mind getting into a fight over something stupid. He was carnal, capricious, and something of a representation of our own impudence, or lack of judgement. Like many of us have done, Thor often acted without thought, and this would usually get him into some kind of trouble, perhaps a warning to the mortals to look before you leap. Regardless of the enemy, whether it be Skamir, the giant, or Jormungand, the world serpent, Thor in mythology was prone to an emotional response, and most, if not all of his encounters, appear to have been spurred on by passion than by logic. This might be something that Marvel gets right in their cinematic universe. Thor isn't exactly the brains of the outfit, especially in the Avengers movies, but he also lacks subtlety and tact in his solo outings that is reminiscent of the original Norse Thor. For instance, when Thor travels to Jotunheim to confront the frost giant Laufey against his father's wishes, we see a battle ensue due to Thor's arrogance, which ultimately destroys the fragile truce between the Asgardians and the Frost Giants. This Thor isn't even able to realise that his brother Loki is behind all of this, 
despite his brother's reputation as a trickster and a conspirator. So short-sighted is Thor, and so intense is his thirst for battle, that the first and only thing he can think of doing is bringing the fight to Jotunheim and putting all of his friends in danger. Such behaviour reminds me of the Norse story of the giant stronghold, where Thor meets the giant king. Thor is travelling with his human servant and the trickster god Loki, who by the way, isn't actually his brother in the mythology, but more on that later. When Thor comes across the stronghold of the giants, he seeks hospitality, but the giants here are not friendly and they tell Thor and his companions that if they wish to stay, they'll have to prove their worth in a series of competitions. The challenges put before Thor are a drinking contest, a strength contest, which challenges Thor to lift up the giant king's cat, and a wrestling match against the giant's old wet nurse. So short-sighted and imperceptive is Thor that he doesn't realise that all of these challenges are rigged. The horn he drinks from in the drinking contest is magically connected to the ocean, and so instead of drinking mead, Thor was actually drinking from the ocean itself, which is why his cup never drained. The cat he tried to lift was actually the great serpent Jormungand, who could not be raised from the sea. The old wet nurse he wrestled was actually old age incarnate, which could never be defeated. From this, it's easy to see that Marvel's Thor and the Norse Thor might not be so different, at least going by their arrogance, audaciousness and just general simplicity. Much like Marvel's Thor trying to take on Laufey for feeling wronged, the Norse Thor's immediate response after realising he had been tricked was to kill the giant king. However, the giant king is able to vanish and evade the thunder god's mighty vengeance. As if to exemplify Thor's credulity, another version of the story exists that proposes that Loki was actually the giant king in disguise and that this was his attempt to humiliate Thor during the three contests. Yet Thor, so blinded by his need to use his fists instead of his words, is none the wiser. Another example of the MCU's Thor and the mythological Thor being so similar is their pugnaciousness. Neither Thor seems to hesitate much when it comes to confrontation, and whilst we see Marvel's Thor come to hesitate in the later movies, for the most part, they seldom question their own ability and aren't shy about demonstrating it. This is true in Marvel's Thor, where after having discovered Mjolnir's location in a shield facility, decides to pretty much infiltrate the facility by himself, without any sort of plan to retrieve it. This is also in spite of him being effectively mortal, after Odin had removed his powers for his previous act of arrogance. Evidently, Thor didn't much care, and this is a great example of his impatience and quickness to temper, rendering him incapable of even considering the possibility of capture or even death. The same might be said of the event in Norse mythology, where Thor encounters a giant who offers to carry Thor's food bag, but ends up tying it so tight that Thor cannot open it. Thor is not seen to consider the alternatives to solving the situation, instead he succumbs to frustration and impatience and ends up attacking the giant in his sleep by striking his head. But each time he strikes the giant, the giant does not accuse Thor, but merely asks if an acorn had fallen on his head. In both of these examples, Thor is humbled. Not only does he fail his mission in both instances, by not retrieving Mjolnir and not getting his lunch bag open, he is ultimately left feeling pretty deflated and likely pretty foolish. It is true that hindsight is 2020, but given Thor's natural recklessness, it's arguable that in both variations, he never quite learns his lesson and continues to be prone to temper then caution. Thor's family The biggest point of contention I found in relation to Marvel's portrayal of Thor is his family, mostly because it differs quite drastically from the mythology. The most notable one is that Loki appears as Thor's stepbrother, after Odin had adopted him from Laufey after the war between them. But in the actual mythology, 
Loki was more of an uncle to Thor. Despite not actually being related, it would appear that at some point, Loki and Odin had become brothers bound by blood, where they mix their blood and swear oaths not to harm each other and their children. I'm uncertain as to why Marvel decided to make Loki and Thor brothers, but I suppose they were trying to distance themselves from the evil uncle trope and perhaps wanted to establish a plotline that echoed a sibling rivalry, which is arguably more relatable, as opposed to something more akin to Hamlet. The MCU's Loki is also portrayed as a regular villain, at least in the early movies. His motivations and agendas are typical of the bad guy, who ultimately wants to rule the world, and whilst both sources do attribute Loki as being a trickster, they do so in quite different ways. For the MCU's Loki, Loki's tricks and deceptions are integral to his role as an antagonist. They are what give him the ability to stand toe to toe with Thor and the Avengers, and they are what drive the plot forward. In Norse mythology however, Loki is not this evil schemer who plots the downfall of Thor, and whilst he's often pranking Thor, he's more of a troublemaker than an outright antagonist. In some cases, he can even be helpful like when he goes along with Thor in an effort to deceive Thrymrir. In this story, where Thrymrir steals Mjolnir whilst Thor is sleeping, it is Loki who finds Thrymrir and reports back to Thor. Later, it is he and Thor who dress up as women, with Thor dressing up as Thrymrir's bride to infiltrate Thrymrir's wedding and steal back Mjolnir. Loki does eventually fall into the role of villain during Ragnarok, however, which comes about after his role in the death of Baldur, Odin's son, who had been blessed with near invulnerability. Determined to find the weakness of Baldur, Loki ended up transforming into an old woman, where he learned from Baldur's mother Freak that only mistletoe could harm him. Now knowing Baldur's weakness, Loki tricked Baldur's blind brother Hod into throwing mistletoe at him. As soon as the mistletoe hit Baldur, he dropped dead, Loki was punished for his deeds and eventually placed inside a cave, where a serpent would drip poisonous venom on his head. He remained there under these conditions until Ragnarok, where he escaped and led the charge against Asgard. Marvel's Odin also has some inconsistencies to the original Norse version. In the MCU, he is benign, regal and wise, and whilst he certainly does have his secrets that lead to some catastrophic events, he's probably not as bad as the Odin from Norse mythology. The first inconsistency I found is that we are led to believe that in the first Thor movie, Odin lost his eye in the war with the frost giant Laufey. In the mythology however, Odin is seen to trade his eye to the wise Mimir, in exchange for a drink from Mimir's well which would grant the recipient all wisdom and all knowledge. In other mythological depictions, Odin is seen to carry Mimir's decapitated head around with him, after Mimir is beheaded in the Ysir Vanir war. Mimir is then permanently responsible for reciting wisdom and counsel to Odin. Mimir is not seen in the MCU however, and we are led to believe that Odin is wise and powerful simply because he is the Allfather. In mythology however, Odin was a zealot for knowledge. Despite already being cunning and quick-witted, his thirst for more knowledge always drove him to more and more drastic measures. Having already traded his own eye for Mimir's wisdom, he can also be seen sacrificing himself upon Yggdrasil, the world tree, in exchange for the understanding of runes. Whilst much of the knowledge he gained was useful and beneficial to those around him, such as being able to heal the sick and being able to calm tempers, he was also known to have learned spells that could make women fall in love with him. Thus, Odin could be seen as a bit of a predator and a player, more akin to the likes of Zeus. This then leads me onto Thor's parentage, for where the MCU portray Frigga as Thor's mother, in Norse mythology, his mother is actually the giantess, Jord. Indeed, Odin was certainly not as loyal in his marriage as he appears to be in the MCU, 
but is instead known for many affairs and the siring of children. It should also be noted that whilst Odin is portrayed as a great figure in the MCU, one who is revered and worshipped, many worshippers in the real world were actually untrusting of Odin. Despite being the Allfather, his thirst for knowledge would lead him into experimenting with black sorcery, which would evoke suspicion in Scandinavian culture. Odin's ability to shapeshift and his legends of walking amongst men also made people wary, for a god who did not announce himself may very well have been up to some skullduggery. The closest comparison we can make to this from the MCU is that Odin hides the existence of his daughter Hela, who he used to conquer the Nine Realms with. This secrecy that casts Odin in a more wicked light is certainly a nod to the Odin of Norse mythology, who was far from benign and certainly far from perfect. On a side note, Hela, or Hel, is not the daughter of Odin in the original mythology, but instead the daughter of Loki, and one of his three children he leads against Asgard during Ragnarok. Another trope that is seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is the Odin sleep, a state which Odin enters in order to recharge his magical ability. In Norse mythology, such a condition is never mentioned, and this appears to be purely a creative liberty by Marvel. Some however have compared the Odin sleep to when Odin hangs himself from Yggdrasil for 9 days and 9 nights in an effort to gain wisdom. Aside from Loki being Thor's brother, the MCU has done little to introduce Thor's real siblings. Whilst I know many of these appear in the comics, most notably Balder, you might say that the movies have missed an opportunity to explore some interesting characters. Thor's brothers, half-brothers considering Odin plays it fast and loose, are Balder, he who cannot be harmed save for a mistletoe, Vali and Vidar, the gods of vengeance, Tyr, the god of war, Bragi, god of poetry and music, Hodder, the blind god who kills Balder after Loki's trickery, and finally Heimdall, who many of you may have already deduced, also differs from the MCU's portrayal. There's also the case for Modi and Magni, those who are Thor's sons, but as of yet, we have not seen them in the MCU. Thor's relationships In the MCU, we see Thor become pretty fixated on Jane Foster, and whilst there is a romance with the warrior Sif, hinted at in the early stages of the first movie, this is eventually swept under the rug. It's ironic then that according to the mythology, Thor was actually married to Sif, although one who wasn't exactly a warrior. This Sif was a fertility goddess who would give birth to Thor's daughter Thrud. This wasn't Thor's first marriage however, for he was said to have married the Jotun Jan Saxa, who gave birth to his sons Modi and Magni. Willingness to Sacrifice The willingness to sacrifice is a feature that virtually all noble heroes demonstrate in a narrative. If a hero doesn't lose something in their efforts to overcome evil, or at least isn't prepared to lose something, then often their status as a hero is cheapened or falls flat. If the MCU's Thor used the same approach he used to retrieve Mjolnir from the shield facility as he did with the destroyer that sent to kill him, then it wouldn't have been very satisfying. Indeed, it would have been amusing to see him try and punch his way through the destroyer, but these wouldn't be the efforts of a hero. Instead, we see Thor attempt to sacrifice himself to the destroyer on the condition that it leaves his friends alone. It's a notable contrast from the earlier Thor who took the fight to Laufey out of vengeance, or who beat up several shield agents to get what he wanted. Sure, it isn't typical Thor from mythology, who no doubt would have gone down swinging, regardless of who got hurt, but it is a different Thor, one who uses his heart and his head to solve a significant conflict. By being willing to sacrifice himself, we do have more sympathy for him, and we do start to recognize him as a hero. Despite being a god, his actions here humanize him and make him more relatable. The same can't necessarily be said about Thor from Norse mythology, 
until maybe the end days of Ragnarok. But even this may not necessarily be the god making a sacrifice. Ragnarok was essentially the Nordic apocalypse. It was a time prophesied to Odin, and it was a time that spelled the end of the god's reign. It had been decreed that this calamitous event could not be avoided, and that though they were bound to die, some, including Thor, would not go quietly into the night. When Ragnarok came, the monstrous wolf Fenrir would break free of his chain and would stride through the Nine Realms bringing destruction and ruin. His sons would swallow the sun and moon, leaving the world in darkness. Hel, the queen of the dead, who was cast out by Odin, would provide Loki with an army of the dead, for which devastating battles were fought, and Surtur, the fire giant, would storm the battlefield and see to the world's annihilation by lighting the world fire. It is with these final battles at Ragnarok that the stage is set for the final battle between Thor and his nemesis, Jormungand. The battle is frenzied and violent, but in the end, Thor is able to slay the serpent. However, he was thought to have also sustained multiple bites from the monster, which filled his veins with poison. Despite having exacted his revenge on Jormungand, Thor is only able to walk a few paces before succumbing to the poison and dying as well. Ragnarok was essentially a metaphor for rebirth. It showed that all things died and that new things would take their place, the circle of life if you will. You might argue that the sacrifice Thor makes here is an effort to save his people. He fights Jormungand to the death and pays the ultimate price to stop his nemesis, and maybe prolongs the end of days. But considering Ragnarok was not avoidable, it's more than likely that there was nothing noble or sacrificial about Thor's battle here, but that he was merely fighting Jormungand because A, he hated him, and B, this would be his last fight ever. In some ways, it is fitting that Thor's final act upon the world is fighting something, but to say he is sacrificing himself for something better isn't really the case. I mean, if you gave him the option to turn Ragnarok off, he'd likely have done it in a heartbeat, because just like us, the gods don't want to die either, hence their resistance. Unlike Marvel's Thor, the Norse Thor doesn't face death with reason and compassion for others, but instead faces it with a sense of aggression for his enemies and a sense of self-preservation. Mjolnir Like the MCU's Thor, the Norse Thor also shares a special relationship with his hammer, though not in a way that you might think. First of all, Mjolnir does not allow Thor to fly, as he is seen to do in the movies. Instead, Thor was believed to ride around in a chariot drawn by two goats known as Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder. This would appear to be the Norse Thor's only way to take to the skies, and even that came with some compromises. For instance, if Thor was lacking for food, he would kill Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder and eat them for dinner, and whilst he would effectively lose his means of transportation, he would have a full belly. There is an idea though that Thor kills his goats with some delicacy, given that it is said that if he's able to kill the goats without breaking their bones, they will resurrect themselves the very next day. Another trope that Marvel introduces in regards to Mjolnir is the worthy aspect. It is the concept that only those who are worthy or pure of heart are able to lift the hammer, and with the exception of Captain America, who demonstrates the virtue of all men, Thor is the only character to wield the weapon. But going by the original myths, it turns out that being worthy had nothing to do with it, for Thor himself required a special set of gloves known as Jan Gripa in order to lift Mjolnir at all. With the original Norse idea, it makes Mjolnir a little cheaper, at least for me, for it no longer is about morals and piety, but instead about equipment. In essence, by these rules, Anyone can lift Mjolnir if they are equipped with the right gloves, which I felt kind of makes it less special. On the subject of equipment, 
The MCU Thor is never seen to bother with anything aside from armor, a cape, and the newer weapon, Stormbreaker. However, one thing that he is seen without is Megan Yoda, a magical belt that when worn by the original Thor in the mythology, increases Thor's strength. With this, it might be said that the MCU Thor has the advantage, at least in terms of strength, for he is able to overcome his obstacles, even fighting Hell, without having to rely on weapons or equipment. A soft spot for Loki As already established, Loki is not the brother of Thor in the original mythology. However, that doesn't mean he didn't maintain a soft spot for him, much as the MCU version does. It would seem that in the MCU, it doesn't matter how often Loki betrays Thor or ends up batting for the opposing team, Thor always finds a way to forgive him. Thor demonstrates a lack of regard for the laws of Midgard when he attempts to rescue Loki from his capture by Captain America and Iron Man, and whilst Loki has justice to face on Earth, Thor wishes to extract him to the relative safety of Asgard. The same can be said when Thor frees Loki from prison, and whilst he only frees him to gain access to Svartalheim, Thor continues to give him the benefit of the doubt. Whilst this isn't necessarily true for the Norse counterparts, especially given that the two end up warring against each other in the final battle of Ragnarok, the Norse Thor certainly does show some unusual patience for the trickster, appearing to not only forgive him for his misfeasances, but also forget them completely. In one tale, Thor's wife, Sif, who unlike her Marvel counterpart had golden hair, was fast asleep. Her hair was known to be her pride and joy, so when Loki snuck into her room and cut it off, she was deeply upset. Perhaps even more upset was Thor, who confronted Loki and threatened to kill him. Realising that Thor wasn't joking around, and definitely didn't appreciate the prank on his wife, Loki promised to replace Sif's hair with golden hair, made by dwarves. Despite being sceptical, Thor is eventually won over by Loki, who convinces him that Sif's new hair would be made of real gold, and so it would have been even better than the hair she had lost. To his credit, Loki is good on his word, but it would appear that Thor had already let the mischievous god off the hook anyway, for he does nothing to ensure that Loki will fulfil his promise. It makes more sense that the MCU's Thor turns a blind eye to Loki's crimes because he is his brother, but why would the Norse Thor be so lenient? Well it might be said that Thor didn't view Loki as a great physical adversary, and whilst Loki could outsmart him, he wouldn't have given him much of a fight. Additionally, there is some idea that Thor was deep down scared of Loki, which is why he allows him to do such nasty things to his family without delivering any certain comeuppance. But perhaps the answer lies closer to the mythology, for it is said that when Loki makes an attempt to rectify his offences, he usually did so with great favours and even greater gifts. This might very well have been the reason why the Norse Thor regarded Loki with some leniency, despite him being the main god who really tried his patience. The gifts of Loki are evidenced in the same tale of Sif's hair, for after promising to obtain golden hair from the dwarves, Loki ends up commissioning the dwarves to create Mjolnir for Thor. Interestingly, this is another difference from the MCU, where it is Odin who commissioned the dwarves to create Mjolnir. Ragnarok We've already established that Ragnarok was the end of all things, most notably the rule of the gods, but the MCU treats this event very differently. Not only do the gods survive in Thor, Loki and Heimdall, but they are able to preserve many of the Asgardians, whilst overcoming some of the otherwise unassailable odds. The same event in Norse mythology was a lot bleaker, with Loki's children, Hel, Fenrir and Jormungand laying waste to Asgard and killing the other gods. Fenrir, for example, devours Odin. Meanwhile, Jormungand, as we've specified already, is able to kill Thor with poison after having been fatally wounded himself. 
Asurta, meanwhile, isn't just there to destroy Asgard, but instead the entire universe, which he succeeds in doing by setting it all on fire. Yet there will still be a new world that will rise from the ashes, and two mortals, two survivors, were believed to be called upon to repopulate the mortal world. Despite the destruction of gods, it is believed that the sons of Thor, who survived the battle, will go to a plane known as Eidavol, an area that would not be destroyed during Ragnarok and that Baldur would return to life again, marking a new age. Of course, with how bleak this all seems at first, it's no wonder that Marvel steered away from the original and went with a version that kept not just the main characters alive, but also everyone else in the universe. After all, if Surtur did set the entire universe on fire, he'd pretty much be doing Thanos' job for him. The God of Thunder The MCU's Thor appears to only have influence over the domain of thunder, but it's true that the Norse Thor had his fingers in more than one pie. He was considered to be an agricultural god, one who could be prayed to to bring about a good harvest, usually through his influence and association with thunder and the weather. It was his chariot's wheels rumbling across the sky, which was said to be the roar of thunder, and with his passing, it was believed that storms would soon be on the way. With storms came rain, and through this, Thor could also be considered a nourisher of crops and fields. Given his associations with storms, it was not unusual for sailors at sea to pray to Thor when the weather turned rough, in the hopes that the thunder god would show them mercy. Because of the amount of seafarers praying to Thor, Thor was also believed to have some association with the water, this being especially true when you consider the myth of Thor and his rowing boat. With Thor being bold and fearless as he crossed dangerous waters, he was also believed to be a god who removed the boundaries of the mortals, encouraging them to explore and go the extra mile, as he would. Thor could also be seen as a protector god, guiding seafarers who were caught in bad weather and delivering them safely to land. Idiot Thor the MCU's Thor shows a character who, whilst blinded by his own arrogance and strength, can actually demonstrate some emotional intelligence. He can grieve, he can inspire, he can even bring one back from the point of despair and channel their feelings into something more productive. Heck, we even see him make some pretty bold choices that whilst might seem brash, are actually the only logical choice. The Norse Thor, however, is a bit more dense, and emotional intelligence might very well be just out of his reach. With Marvel's Thor, he's able to process emotions and express how he feels, and whilst this isn't always done in the healthiest of ways, it probably beats getting into random fights, or in one case, an insult match. Going by one story, the Norse Thor is reduced to a swearing, bumbling mess as he comes across a river, Calling to the ferryman to take him across, the ferryman, who is Odin in disguise, introduces himself as Harbard. But Harbard isn't the most friendly ferryman by any means, and he proceeds to antagonize Thor, calling him names and insulting him. To his credit, Thor is able to hold his tongue, perhaps on the account that he was more stunned by the ferryman, or perhaps on the account that he wasn't sure what the ferryman was actually saying because he may have used big words. Harbert begins to call Thor a peasant and refuses to ferry him, believing that a man like Thor couldn't possibly have the money for such a journey. He also insults his wife, Sif, accusing her of being a whore. The more Thor attempts to combat Harbert's fiery insults, the more he finds himself ill-equipped to retort. Odin was after all the wittiest and the smartest, so it makes sense that in this war of words, he is able to undo Thor and leave him wanting for better insults. I suppose considering Odin's intellect, it would be unfair to call Thor stupid, for anyone would likely find themselves stalling to respond to the All-Father's jibes. 
Yet him being so easily overwhelmed by mere words is a testament to Thor's weakness and shows us that despite being mighty and strong, it isn't everything. In fact, the moral of this story serves to show us that brains are victorious over brawn and that if one is smart enough, they can defeat a stronger man without actually having to fight him. It's the sort of thing that a deity like Odin would know all too well, though it's also probable that had Thor really gotten pissed off, Odin would have had an escape plan. The Guile of Thor We've had a lot of discussion thus far about how incompetent Thor is when it comes to being cunning or deceptive. As a character who is often portrayed as bullheaded and reckless, it's usually the case they would not be much use when it comes to strategy or common hoodwinking. So imagine my surprise when I came across a poem known as the Talk of Alvis in Norse mythology, where we see Thor finally sweep the rug out from someone else's feet. We are told that a dwarf named Alvis meets with Thor and begins to discuss with him a contract that he has made with the other gods. The contract ensures that Alvis is to marry the daughter of Thor, but because Alvis is a dwarf and of no particular strength, Thor is ultimately unimpressed by him. So instead of smashing his brains out with Mjolnir, as he was prone to do with problems he couldn't solve, Thor actually used his words and convinced the dwarf that if he wanted to marry his daughter, the contract wouldn't cut it. Instead, Alvis would need to convince Thor to surrender his daughter by answering all of his questions. But to make matters difficult, Thor's questions were long-winded and required elaborate answers. But this was all just a trick by Thor, for Thor knew that dwarves, at least in this story, turned into stone when the sun rose. Because Alvis was so distracted with answering all of Thor's questions, he didn't notice that the morning had come, and with that, he turned to stone, and was denied from marrying at all. The Guile of Thor is not something that's explored very often in Norse mythology, or in the MCU, but I suppose the lesson that can be gained from this particular story is that eventually, even someone as dull-witted as Thor can be deceptive, and that just because someone shows a lack of skill in a certain area, they should not be underestimated, especially the gods. As far as the MCU goes on the other hand, the only instance that I can think of where Thor demonstrates deception is when he tricks Loki and stuns him by anticipating his inevitable betrayal. Of course, you could argue however that this isn't a deception by Thor, and merely Thor getting his own back on Loki, as well as Loki getting his just desserts. Merciless Thor Both Thor in the MCU and Thor in the mythology have moments of mercilessness, though as you might imagine, it's far more evident in the Norse Thor, who is far less redeemable. In the story of Thor's fishing trip, Thor goes on an innocent enough fishing trip with the giant Hymir, but before long, the two appear to be at odds. Hymir refuses to give Thor any bait to fish with, and so in anger, Thor decapitates Hymir's favourite ox, and uses the ox's head as his bait instead. Not keen on getting on Thor's bad side, Hymir does not challenge the god for his affront, and instead makes the best of the trip by rowing to his favourite spot. There he catches several fish, and content with his yield, wishes to return home. But Thor is not so content, and demands they go further into the ocean in the hopes that they come across the Great Serpent. Despite dissuading Thor against this, Thor ignores Hymir and takes control of the boat for himself. Using the ox head as his bait, he casts his line into the sea, and lo and behold, Thor's nemesis, Jormungand, takes the bait. In a chaotic struggle, Thor hauls the serpent from the sea and the giant world serpent is revealed above the surface for all to see. Whilst Hymir trembles with fear and certain dread, Thor reaches for his hammer and attempts to draw the serpent closer. But so lost in his vengeance to slay the serpent, Thor fails to notice that as he draws the serpent closer to him, the boat threatens to capsize. 
Hymir, fearing for his life, cuts Thor's line, causing Thor to lose his balance. Jormungand, having now achieved the bait, dives beneath the surface and flees to fight another day. Enraged by Hymir's intervention, Thor struck the giant with such force it sent him flying overboard, forcing him to swim back to shore. In another version, Thor's temper is so fierce that he bludgeons Hymir with his hammer until the giant is dead. Once more, we must take into consideration the temper and rage of the Norse Thor, who though was well liked by mortals, was probably held at arm's length by many of the other gods. In some cases, as I'm sure Hymir will attest to, the Norse Thor is volatile, explosive, and above all, unconsolable in his anger. In this story, and many others though, his destructive outbursts cannot be justified, and just like with Hymir, Thor comes across as more of a psychopath than a deity, one who would sooner bludgeon you to death on a whim. At least the MCU's Thor isn't so violent, though we do see him exhibit some similar characteristics. One that springs to mind is where Thor decapitates Thanos, and whilst we can agree it was the only thing left to do, Thor denies anyone else of their vengeance, and selfishly claims satisfaction for himself. He even slays Thanos in front of his daughter, sparing no thought for her despite her new allegiance. This is a Thor that is more akin to the Thor from mythology, one who doesn't hesitate when it comes to a fight, and one who certainly doesn't hold back. I think it's fair to say that had the Thor from Norse mythology been on the battlefield in Wakanda, he wouldn't have wasted any time going for Thanos' head the first time around. But let me know what you think of Thor from the MCU and Thor from Norse mythology, and which one you prefer. Do let me know in the comments below if there are any differences or similarities between the two Thors that I might have missed. And as always, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.